In today's webinar, we're going to talk about all things special needs trusts. We're going to dig deep into what is a special needs trust? How do you go about using one? Why would you use one? Do you need a special needs trust in addition to an ABLE account? Or can you use one or the other sort of interchangeably? We're going to talk about how to fund special needs trusts, how to not fund special needs trusts. Um, we're going to talk about first party, third party special needs trusts. We're going to talk about pooled special needs trusts all things special needs trust and with that we will turn to our resident expert my name is keith caldwell i am a parent just like most of you guys out there um, and i am learning and listening from ryan as well because i have a lot of questions myself as i plan for the future when i'm gone so with that uh, i'll let ryan go ahead and introduce himself yeah i mean that list from keith i'm tired myself just thinking about it Holy mackerel. But um, but I appreciate everybody sending your questions in. Um, you know, if, if this is the first time uh, that you're coming uh, to this webinar, thank you so much. Uh, Keith and I have been uh, blessed to uh, be doing those these for folks since I believe 2013, Keith, if I remember correctly. So we've it's been a we, while. we've gone through we've gone through quite a number of iterations uh, and we've stumbled on doing some of these question and answer sessions. Uh, because, you know, we want to make sure we're answering questions that that you guys have. And so we appreciate everybody that sent in questions uh, on special needs trusts. And and certainly, you know, that's a, that's what we're going to talk about. So so I know Keith has a bunch of those questions. Uh, we've reviewed them together. But just to give us an idea, there's a couple questions in there, just like he started, you know, why bother doing a special needs trust? I already have an irrevocable trust. Why would I need a special needs trust? You know, primarily for the families we serve, um, they have a child that obviously has a disability and uh, is either using today or planning to use some benefits um, from the government whether that's state or federal government. And many of those benefits fall under what's called the kind of Medicaid umbrella. And so have to follow Medicaid financial requirements, which is an asset limit and a monthly income limit. And so the reason to use a, spe one of the reasons to use a special needs trust versus just a regular irrevocable trust for any assets you want to provide your loved one, your child, is because the special needs trust has very specific language in it that allows your child to have this money and be the beneficiary of this trust and yet still be able to access these government benefits, mm -hmm. right? Still be able to qualify uh, for them from a financial perspective. Just a regular irrevocable trust doesn't have that language in it. So, so it wouldn't, it, it would still, the government would look at it and say, yeah, I understand it's an irrevocable trust, but it's not designed as a special needs trust. So they'll count that asset for qualification and your child will very likely lose their benefit or the opportunity to have it. So that's one of the main reasons for a special needs trust is to be able to still have your child have money and have money available to them but at the same time, be able to keep or access uh, government benefits. And that can be from health care. It can be from helping to provide uh, living arrangements, can help to provide food, right? SNAP, right? And, and or what we what a lot of people call food stamps, right? But but those nutritional assistance programs can be hundreds of dollars a month to go buy groceries. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's an additional benefit that we really haven't talked much about, Keith, in the eight years we've been doing this. We haven't talked about it, it at all. Right. That's probably the first time. But that's a big benefit for a lot of individuals with a disability is that additional dollars to help buy food. Um, and so you could lose all those if it's not structured properly. And so that's one of the main reasons for the special needs trust. So it, interestingly enough, as I as I reviewed some of those questions, other things came up and said, well, how much, I don't even know how much I put in there, right? How would I know how much to put in there as I'm starting to plan? I mean, life is so variable, mm -hmm. you know, how do I, how do I figure out how to put in there? Is it really even worthwhile starting a trust? You know, I saw one question, Hey, my child's 14. Should I even start one now? Cause I have no idea how to split up my assets. I don't know how much should go in there versus how much should go for my other kids or, 
or how much I should save in there today right. because I'm still trying to save for my retirement. And so I always answer that with, with a question like, you're right, that that can be a challenge. <clears throat> but what I would come back to you and say is that everybody's number is going to be a little bit different based upon where your child is at 14, 15, 16, 5, 6, 36. But that's why you do a full plan, right? right? So, and that's what a lot of these questions are about is, is there is a way to project out mm -hmm. what your child's costs might look like over their lifetime right. based upon what their diagnosis is today mm -hmm. and where they are developmentally today. It be, and, and how do you do that? Well, you either latch on to how to secure the future you find a, a planner that does this work mm -hmm. and they should be able to guide you through that process and help you figure it out. And then you'll know exactly how much you need for your retirement and how much your child needs. And then you can make decisions with information with great clarity. So, so but there is, is a way to do that. You just need to get in touch with the right people. So part of that would also uh, necessitate having an understanding about your costs for your other children, marriage, college, all other things that you have as a parental obligation. So you can't just yeah. look at it just for you and your spouse and yourself's retirement. You got to also consider your other, your other, your other children if they have any other needs as well, in addition to the child with disabilities. It, it, exactly right, and and that's why it is, you know, a very comprehensive view of your family in terms of being able to make these decisions. Um, because part of that also goes back to a, a, a number of, of folks, of, of you guys who came back with questions. Again, we appreciate you filling those out. Is, well, why don't I just do an ABLE account? What the heck is the difference anyway? Why bother? We had, right, Keith? I mean, I don't know how many of the questions that we have. But that was, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that, that was a pretty consistent theme. And that's pretty typical. We get that question a lot is, hey, why not just why not just do an ABLE account? Seems a whole lot easier mm -hmm. to, to, to do that. What the heck is the difference? Um, there's a few main differences. One, the ABLE account has an annual funding limitation. Right. Right. So so it has a cap that you can put in every year. A properly designed special needs trust has no cap. Mm -hmm. Right. You could put five dollars, five million, 50 million, mm -hmm. whatever. Right. So there's no cap there. Um, so there could be more flexibility in terms of when you decide to fund it, meaning that many people will fund a special needs trust at the end of their life. So if you decide that's how your funding mechanism is going to work, then if you're just using an ABLE account, you have to make sure you have less than fifteen thousand dollars at the end of your life that you want your child with a disability to have and utilize. Right. So, again, that can be limiting. Uh, the other piece is the ABLE account is is going to have a um, value limitation, meaning contribution and growth inside the account right now. Um, when it gets up to a certain amount of money, um, one of the government benefits, it's called SSI, which is a monthly income, mm -hmm. will be suspended. Right. So not lost or forfeited but just suspended until the ABLE account goes below that account value maximum. Isn't it like $100,000 um, or close to that? It is, yep. So it's still that $100,000, right? And then SSI, but you can have more than $100,000 in an ABLE account, but that's going to impact one of your loved one's possible government benefits. There is no account value limit inside of a properly drafted special needs trust that's going to limit any of the government benefits right ssi included well let me, now, let, me just, let me just share real quickly so for other parents who might be struggling with this as well i have a special needs trust and an able account and how i use them is i use the able account primarily to manage myself so that I can access funds right away without having to deal with the trustee and all that kind of stuff. I focus on those kinds of things. So I also tell my, my family and friends who want to give donations or contributions or birthday gifts to my son to go ahead and do it through the ABLE account. Because my son's a little 
hard to buy gifts for because he can't really communicate what he's looking for. But I know the kind of things he likes. So people put money into that account. I have access to it so I can, without having to go to a trustee or any of that kind of seeking reimbursement, I can just go do it with a card and pay for his golf lessons or whatever we want to do. So I sort of use them as tier. So if someone's going to donate a little bit of money, a couple hundred dollars, 500 or a thousand, whatever, it goes into that. Um, so I have them set up for two different reasons. The other one is more long term so that when I'm gone, he's going to have larger amounts of money to be able to do things with. So that's sort of how I use it. But the requirement, I think, of having both of them is pretty high. Oh, man. It, it, everybody, listen to Keith <laughs> preach it. He hit it. the nail on the head. Long term, larger sums of money, think special needs trust. Right. Shorter term, smaller amounts of money, think ABLE account. And more flexibility. A lot more flexibility on the ABLE account when you have and, someone else managing your money on the trust. I have a first party trust for my son. I also have a third party trust for different reasons. Um, I can manage a third party trust, but I'm still looking at that as a long term solution that I don't really do much with. I'm using ABLE account to, to live day to day kind of thing. And, and that's absolutely true because one of the benefits of an ABLE account, everybody, is <laughs> that it, right now, in the rules of the ABLE account, you can still pay for more things out of the ABLE account than you can from the special needs trust. I mean, they're close, but you can still pay for some more things out of the ABLE account than a special needs trust. The benefit is that now there's a rule that says you can take money from a special needs trust, like Keith's doing, and put it in the ABLE account. Um, as long as you have enough room of that 15. annual max right of that annual maximum so keith's absolutely right they absolutely work together but that is usually a question we get is you know is it is it one or the other you know why should i have this special needs trust if i can do an able account hopefully we just answered that question for you uh, hey ryan um can you talk really quickly about a pool trust because i know i said we we're going to talk about that um, and then and then we'll sort of start getting questions. And I want to share with you something Ryan doesn't know. Some people who follow us on YouTube might know what I'm about to say. But Ryan does not unless you happen to see the video on YouTube. Um, but um, um, so, Ryan, tell us a little bit about pool trust. OK, um, he's everybody. Keith is keeping me in suspense as well. He's I don't know this. He's got like a cliffhanger going on. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, so I'm, I'm very, I mean, I am on the edge of my seat, but I'll talk about pool trust because that's what Keith told me to do. And I do what he tells me. I like that. Um, the, uh, so a pool trust, uh, is, you know, I always liken it to, uh, if everybody, and this can be depending on all of our ages, this can be a distant memory. Uh, but one I want you to bring up from the archives, I don't know if you guys remember elementary school. But, but kind of when you walked into elementary school, there was one wall in your classroom mm -hmm. that kind of had all these cubby holes, right? And that's where you put your book bag and your uh, jacket and anything else you had, and it was yours, mm -hmm. right? But it was a wall full of them. Think of that wall when you think of a pool trust. So your loved one would have their cubby hole in the wall. Mm-hmm. But then another person would have another cubby hole and another person would have another cubby hole. And what the organization who's managing that trust um, for your child is going to do is they're going to take the money from your trust and the money from the other person's trust and so on and so forth and pool that money together so they can hire a professional money manager to manage the investment side. And then what this organization does is they're the trustee of your child's portion of it. So let's say your child's portion is $100,000 and there's $6 million in this pooled trust. Well, the 6 million is being managed as one entity by an investment manager, but yet they're managing your child's account so when they take money out of it, it goes against your child's account. The your benefit, child's cubby hole. Your child's cubby hole. That's exactly right. And so how what the the reason for that a lot of times is why you might use a pooled trust is, you know, one, if you just don't have the assets necessary to have your own third party trust. 
or it, it could be a reason of trustee, right? Maybe you want this organization as the trustee um, uh, and you want them to be the trustee of the trust. And, and this is what they offer. They offer this pool trust um, mechanism. Um, because what happens is the, the good part about a pooled trust is that if your child's money runs out, they don't necessarily kick your child out of their services. Um, because most pooled trusts, what happens is, is they're going to have other people who pass away before their money runs out. Mm -hmm. And typically a pooled trust organization, you know, gets to keep a good portion of that money. Um, at, at the end of their child's life that may help to fund other people. So it could be that, um, and we've had some people decide this, that don't have any other children. And that's an organization that, that has helped them out or will help them out by doing this. And they kind of want to pay it forward if their child does pass away with money still in their pool trust account. Um, and the money wasn't going to go to any other heirs or any other children. So they feel good about if there is money left over, it's going to go to other individuals with a disability to help them. Excellent. Okay, Ryan, and I see you guys' questions coming in. I'm going to get to them and I'm going to get to some of the questions that we had from um, people who've already submitted in. But what I wanted to share with you, Ryan, and I did look, get preface, it was not a good thing. And the reason I've been sort of gone for the last couple of months is I experienced yet another loss probably my best friend over the last 20, 25 years, and who was my number one person after my death, who was gonna take over my kids, who's in my special needs trust and on and on and on, very entwined, part of my letter of intent, all of it died unexpectedly in May. Totally oh. did not see that coming. And one, I was very, very depressed as a result of it. I just couldn't focus on anything other than that, but. I bring it all here because it's applicable for all of us. And the reason it's applicable for all of us is you just never know, right? And now I have to revise my special needs trust. I have to revise my letter of intent. I have to think about that because now my son is the number one. And I don't think it's fair for a 21 year old to take, if something happened to me tomorrow, to be the primary person on my side. So I need to find another adult to squeeze in there between him and that. So my situation got super complicated. So one of the questions I want to ask you is, and when those kinds of circumstances occur, what kinds of things should we be looking at we might need to change? That's question number one. And the other thing I'm putting out to the rest of the families out there, because it also got me thinking about, I'm here to deal with this loss. And it was a very painful loss. But what if the next caregiver has to experience the same kind of thing? Are we going to leave him or her the proper instructions of how to deal with that, what the little nuances are. Because I realize that 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 I'm aware, I'm here, I know what the nuances are of planning, at least to what I've learned from Ryan, but what if my next caregiver is taking over me and they experience their next person? I know it's getting a little complicated, but I want you guys to sort of think through that because we have to, to fill in the gap in our own thinking about how things play out as best we can. I mean, we can't be perfect, but as best we can to sort of think through how these kinds of unforeseen things, because she was in her forties and I totally wasn't expecting that to happen. Um, but it did. And it happens to some of us out there all the time. And I want you guys to not be blindsided like I was, but to learn from my situation and how I deal with it because I know that I need to change these things because she's no longer there to provide that service. So that's what I've been going through. And that's why I've been sort of gone for the last couple of months, because I just, I said, as of July one, I'm going to get my head back in the game and I'm ready to start getting to work. But the last couple of months, I just, I was running around being a nomad because she was my best friend for literally the last 25 years. So that Ryan is the not so good news I wanted to share with you, but I wanted to make it applicable for others as well. So qu first question is, can you give me like a laundry list, just not what to do, but what things as a result of this unexpected death should I be looking at possibly changing? I identified a special needs trust. I identified my letter of intent. Was there something else I should be concerned with or thinking through? I'm so sorry, man. Thanks, Ryan. It stinks. The, um, 
Uh, and I'm sorry for her family as well. The uh, single mom with a 11 year old daughter. So it just is. It's heartbreaking. Yeah. The, uh, I mean, I think, uh, it, you know, you're thinking of the right thing, right? When, when somebody passes away or also, you know, is not available anymore, right? Maybe they move to a different country mm -hmm. and it's just not going to be functional for them. Um, you know, that, that's why it is important to, you know, go back at, and review all these documents to make sure that the same people are still the same people, um, uh, you know, to be able to handle these jobs. I, I think you're right. Um, you want to go back and, you know, think through the, the folks in the special needs trust and, and adjust who that is. Um, uh, you know, certainly the letter of intent as well. Um, and that's, you know, to me, Keith, this, this, uh, and sometimes I know it sounds self-serving when I say it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, don't do this stuff on your own. I mean, find an organization that focuses on this stuff and get a relationship mm -hmm. and be a partner with them. I mean, you know, it just, you know, just last month, Keith, I had a similar situation. I mean, I was a family I've worked with for years and years and years. I was in the hospice room, right, with them four weeks ago. I mean, he's, you know, the dad's 67 years old. Right. He's, as I continue to age, that's not very old. You know, not, not 40, right. right, but but diagnosed with cancer in December and in hospice within June. Right. And 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 it, I feel like it, you really want professionals in your corner who know you, know your family right. and can take some of that responsibility to make sure things are done right. and and to make sure that you get them done, because we all have good intentions. But then it just kind of. Everything gets overwhelming. Right. No, we haven't done this before. I mean, I know Keith and I. And, and this is no offense to anybody. Keith and I were, and this is why we do these webinars. We love answering these questions. Mm -hmm. Keith and I were, we're kind of just kind of chatting before we started. And we're like, yeah, did you review the questions? Yeah, yeah, I reviewed the questions. I said, did they seem similar to other webinars we've done? Keith was like, yeah, they're about the same. They're, they're always the same questions. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. That's okay, because that's what we're here to answer. Um, but what I want to make sure is that families, you get the answers to your questions, but that then you figure out how to use those answers. Right. And that's the hard part. I mean, I can give you generalized answers here, but that doesn't do you. I mean, yeah, it gives you some information, mm -hmm. but it doesn't help your plan. Right. right? I mean, it, what I just said was you, you need to figure out what those cost projections are. And a lot of people say it's impossible. Well, it's not because that's what I do for a living. Mm -hmm. So I know it's not. And we get pretty darn close because we've had 16 years of experience and track record of doing that for countless families. Mm -hmm. And now we know because they're dying. And we know what the numbers need to be. And that's what I'm talking about. Those are the kind of relationships you want. You know, if, if you know what the problem is, there's a solution out there. <laughs> Right. If you know you have a heart issue. Yeah, go to a webinar and learn about it, but eventually call the cardiologist and go make an appointment. I mean, right. I mean, it, again, because these things happen and then and then, like you said, Keith, I mean, yeah, and we've talked about this before, too, is as you do this planning, you want to have meetings like literally facilitated meetings with all those people, right? So so now, Keith, your circle just got smaller. True. Right? Because one of those people that would be in those meetings isn't anymore. So now your meetings are going to be you, your son, you talked about your niece, your ex, mm -hmm. and literally those are the meetings that families should have. Is that hard for families to organize? Yes. Is it hard for somebody to me, for somebody like me to organize and make the family do it? No. 
because it's a third party. It's always easier for a third party to walk in and say, hey, this is the meeting we're going to have. Here's the agenda. Come with your questions about your family's plan and what everybody's responsibility is. It just is. Right. I mean, it, it, it's just the way because families have dynamics. <laughs> all, right? I mean, all true. of us do. Right. And all of ours do. Um, I mean, shoot. That's why I've been to a therapist before. <laughs> right. I mean, they, they know what to do. Right. Our, my family's been to one. <laughs> they know what to do. Right. It's just the again. Well, yeah. And, and they can help guide, you know, kind of that process and that exploration to kind of uncover those layers of maybe people or organizations, right, that may be able to be down the line in terms of a trustee, right? As we, as, as we lose people, maybe there is an organization that, that you want to have as part of that trustee lineup so that if your loved one with a disability outlives everybody, there's at least a final, you know, stop loss of an organization um, that would be able to step in. Um, and, and, and that's part of what the family would decide. All right, Ryan, we're going to go ahead and take some questions because I, I, and we, you and I can talk offline, but I just wanted to share that with you and with you out there, because some of you might be experiencing the same thing. Some of you might be about to experience the same things and your future caregivers may experience those same things. So we need to, while we're here, be thinking through the instructions we would give the next caregiver that if this happens, these are the kinds of things that you should be looking to do. How you communicate that could be in your letter of intent. It could be video instructions. It could be any combination of the above. But I didn't even think about that aspect of it until it hit me. And I realized that I need to prepare my next generation for that potentiality as well. All right. Okay. So let me grab a couple questions here. I've got my iPad because I can't do two things at once. Um, so I need line four. Wait, these are not done in lines. All right. Your greatest, your greatest, your greatest plans always come forward. So let's go from here. So if we must hire a professional trustee, uh, oh, let me go. I'm leaving my house to my I'm leaving my house to my special needs grandson. Can the trust pay for taxes, insurance, and utilities? I I remember that one. That that is great. So so just as the as the question reads. Right. I'm leaving my house to my grandson with a disability. Well, if you leave it directly to your grandson's name. So, you know, Jack Brown actually owns the house. Then a special needs trust cannot cannot pay for the expenses of the home. Right. It can't do that. Um, what can pay for it is any of the government benefits. Because one of the one of the rules still with a special needs trust is not supposed to pay for kind of rent or utilities, um, but but and really not supposed to pay for grocery store. Right. That's what the government benefits are supposed to pay for. Um, but the workaround to that is instead of just having your grandson own it, you know, have the have your grandson's special needs trust own the home. And then and and if that's your plan, you also will want to have some liquid assets inside the special needs trust so that it can pay for some of those expenses. The other thing that you would also do in that respect, if that's the way you design it, is you would more than likely set up some type of rental agreement um, with your grandson so that a portion of his government benefit income can then be deposited into the special needs trust. So the special needs trust would be the landlord because it owns the house. It'll get rent from your grandson to help pay the bills of the house. But there's always gotta be a liquid fund 
And Keith knows this because he, uh, I'm sorry, I shouldn't probably say his personal business, but Keith is a real estate guy. Mm -hmm. So he has real estate and he knows stuff happens with real estate state that needs to get paid. And you need liquid money to be able to do that, right? You need liquid money to maintain a piece of property. Mm -hmm. And so that's what I always suggest. If you're going to own a home that your uh, child or grandchild with a disability is going to live in, you know, own it with the trust, you know, let the trust own it, have another account owned by the trust that's actually money, uh, liquid money, and then probably set up some type of rental agreement um, between the trust that owns the home and uh, the adult with the disability. All right. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Um, is a special needs created under a will required to pay back Medicaid after the recipient dies for the benefits received? And they put it in parentheses in Georgia, but I think this is going to be the answer nationwide, right? Yeah. So, yeah, so it, it won't really matter in Georgia or, or anywhere else. So, so again, there, there are several ways to set up a uh, special needs trust. Um, you can set it up inside your will, just like you mentioned. Uh, that's called a testamentary trust, meaning it doesn't come into existence until you go out of existence. Right. So so your so your will has to come into play. And then once your will is executed, meaning you're already gone, then that trust pops into place. And in that case, that kind of trust is going to be called a third party supplemental needs trust. And I know this language is just there's a couple different terms in there, but this is called a third party supplemental needs trust. And as long as the language is properly written, then then there shouldn't be a payback to Medicaid with that type of trust at the end of your child's life. Um, the other way to set up a third party supplement on these trusts is you set it up outside of your will so it exists at the on the same day that you create it so that you don't have to die to fund it. Um, sometimes that can provide more flexibility for families because you can add money to it or extended family can, grandparents, aunts, uncles, friends, can add money to it before you're dead, right? So you don't have to die for it to come into existence. So that can provide more flexibility, but it can also provide a little bit of what Keith was mentioning before, a little bit of planning ahead. Mm -hmm. Meaning if you have, and this was another question by an 80 year old mom. Yeah, I remember that. Uh, um, that, 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 that was talked about. So we'll lead into that one too is, you know, do I fund the trust now or just wait till I'm dead? And so, you know, with a testamentary trust that's inside the will, you have to wait till you're dead. Um, with a standalone third party supplemental needs trust, you don't have to. And what I would say is you don't want to. I don't mean fund it with a lot of money, but I mean, start the trust. I don't care if it's a checking account. Mm -hmm. Just have an account number that you can utilize. And why do we do that? because it's easier for the next people, because it's already done. They don't have to think about how the heck do I set up a special needs trust? What tax information do I need? Where do I go do that? How do I go do that? Um, right, all those questions they have to answer at a time when they're mourning the loss of someone they love, which could be a parent, True. right? Because you'll be dead. And if you have other kids, they're gonna have to handle that. So they're going to have to handle everything. And what we want to try to do is take as much off of their plate as we possibly can to make it that much of a smoother transition. So, again, if it's a properly drafted third party supplemental needs trust, whether it's inside your will or a standalone, it will not have a payback to Medicaid. And the reason is, is because it's not your child's money. Third party means that it's that the money that funded that trust is from a third party to your child. So it's from you, grandparents, aunts, uncles, anybody else. What Keith mentioned earlier was another type of special needs trust, which is a first party special needs trust. That's different. First party, just because it says first party, means it's your child's money. And some of you might think, uh, where are they going to get money from? Good question. <laughs> from mom and dad. For most of you, yeah, for most of you, 
it's not going to, that's not going to be applicable. But for some of you, it will be. So for some families, there might have been an accident or some type of lawsuit that, that, um, that ended with or resulted in a financial settlement. That financial settlement should go into a first party special needs trust because that was uh, provided to your child for a specific reason or harm to them. That type of trust, because it's your child's asset and money, does have a Medicaid payback to it, which means that if there's money left in that trust when your child passes away, Medicaid can come back in and state, since that trust has been opened, here are all the services we provided this individual, and here are the costs associated with those services. We want to get paid back for those costs or for as many as we possibly can. They can do that out of a first party special needs trust. They can't do that, at least as long as it's drafted properly. See that caveat I threw in there, everybody? <laughs> as long as it's drafted properly out of a third party supplemental needs trust. So that's that's very important. The other reason why a first party trust might be appropriate was another question that I saw and reviewed was, hey, I have a and one of the questions was something to the effect of I have a third party supplemental needs trust drafted for my son. If they get an unknown inheritance from someone, can I just dump it in that trust? No, not if they're named specifically in that in that other person's will or on a beneficiary designation as going directly to them. Really, you should really, in that case, it's really their money and it should be a first party special needs trust that should be designed to capture that money. And as a parent or grandparent or aunt or uncle, you should never add your money to a first party special needs trust. See how, and, and Keith kind of mentioned this really quickly, but it's a very important distinction that he had to do in his plan. And I know he doesn't mind me sharing this stuff because he would anyway. He's, his son has a first party special needs trust. But if you heard him, he said he started a third party supplemental needs trust and enable account. Mm -hmm. And the reason is, is if Keith dies, mm -hmm. he has money that he wants to go to his son with autism, right? A specific dollar amount. Mm -hmm. Well, he doesn't want that blended into the first party special needs trust because if his son with autism predeceases his other son, mm -hmm. He doesn't want all the assets to go back to the government. Right. He wants at least the assets that he did himself, earned himself, saved himself, invested himself, that if his son with autism doesn't use that amount in that supplemental needs trust during his life, he wants it to go to his family, not back to the government. Hence the reason for both of those trusts in his situation. Right. So again, for many families, you might have to have two for a period of time. And let me, let me, and this is helpful or not, I hope it is to other families, but there might be other people that are in similar situations. The first party trust was set up as a result of a court order because of the lawsuit. My son got a, a lawsuit, so that I'm really outside of that. Um, but I've instructed the next caregivers that to deplete the funds from the first party trust first, because as Ryan just said, that if something's left over in that, and that that money goes back to the state, most likely they're going to come back and say, we paid this, we paid that, we want all that money back. So we're focusing on depleting that first. I mean, we're not trying to deplete it, but we're expending funds from that first. The other one I set up as a third party trust and I added my son and soon to be my niece as secondary, um, what, what do you call them? Trustees. Trustees. Um, be able to manage that account. It's an investment account. So we have mutual funds and other things that are in that thing um, so that they have the ability. If something happens to me, they can come in and make trades and stuff on that behalf. And that can grow. So if my other son does not use all the funds in that account, he predeceases my other son, these funds could be bequeathed to my other son without a disability because they go back to that. So that's why we have them separated like that. Um, hopefully that's helpful for people. Yep. And how I funded part of the third party is, yeah, I'll, just, I'll, be, I'll be authentic, you guys will know. Most of you guys know that my dad died last year and he had an inheritance. I didn't need 
the money necessarily. So I donated it or I gifted it to my son with autism and put it into this third party trust so that he could have more funds to invest. I mean, I used some of it, but I didn't need the majority of it. I just put some in there. So my son had assets in this third party trust because part of it is you don't want to put money in there that you're going to need. Right. So you don't want to overfund it to where you're like, uh oh, I need a new roof for myself. And you can't go back to that trust and take it out because it's not for that your son's exclusive benefit. So I've been sort of, you know, deciding what my needs are and making changes and adjustments to my plan based upon my circumstance. So everyone's a little different. Hope that is helpful for people. OK. Uh oh. You shrunk and went away. All right. Let's see. Oh, this is one I've not seen before, Ryan. Um, how can we make sure our inheritance will not affect my child's college application? Is financial aid or his financial aid or able to receive government assistance? Will it impede it? I don't think I've seen that one before. Yeah, no, that that, that is definitely a new one. So, so again, if if, if there is an inheritance coming in, um, again, that the the, the if your child's going to, you know, need government benefits and those types of things, then, um, you know, absolutely, I would use a standalone third party supplemental needs trust and and guide the and and direct those dollars into that, um, because, again, your child's the beneficiary of that trust, not the owner. Very important distinction, um, you know, when you're going for, you know, it, financial aid, that would be helpful there, um, you know, but also for government benefit qualification purposes. Okay. Um, you know, I see this question here, Ryan, if you don't mind sort of addressing the question of, you talked about the inheritance, where is that? I lost my train of thought. Weird noise. I think my house is 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 doing weird things. Um, Your house is talking to you. <laughs> it is. So this was assuming third party trust is set up prior to acquiring unforeseen inheritance. Can the money be put in this particular trust and not impact benefits? I guess it's about if it's designed properly. Well, again, if it's a if it's a third party supplemental needs trust and the inheritance comes in directly to your child. You should really, to be really safe, is is really do a new first party special needs trust and put that inheritance into that one and then use that money first for any of their needs going forward. So, um, that would be the safest way to do it. You could try to do it the other way, but you're taking a risk if Social Security starts to examine right. um, that money. Well, I'm going to share something with people. Ryan ha might be have the same experience. The question we get primarily the most time is how much does it cost? How much does it cost? How much does it cost? So I've seen it. I mean, we paid, uh, I think, 2500 or 3000 for his first party trust um, and then another 2500 for the other one. So $5,000 between the two of them. Um, I don't know if that's the ballpark. I mean, if someone's charging you $20,000, unless your situation is super complex, I think that's probably un unreasonable. So I would think if you're shooting for yeah. the... 2500 to maybe 5000 range is probably in the ballpark, do you think, Ryan? Probably in the ballpark, yep. Yeah, I mean, yep. your situation is super complex, so just plan for that. And how I look at it is I was at Starbucks recently, and I paid for a coffee, and I paid $5 for it. I said, if I'm drinking a coffee 5 bucks a day, that's going to be about $2,400 for the year of, of money. So we can find a way to fund for these things if we just, you know, be creative about it and, and make that a priority. So I don't want that to be the reason, but it's going to cost about about that. So I want to address those questions because we get that a lot. Right. Yeah. Like, yeah. And I think the assumption yeah. is really, really expensive. Yeah. And it depends on the area of the country you might be in as well, which will which will have an impact. Let's talk about two things that I saw questions that came in. We're going to group them all together in the interest of time. And then I'm going to get to you guys over there. I'm, I haven't forgot you, but I'm giving priority to the people who submitted them first. 
So there's a question of taxation. There's a question of funding and how not to fund. I know you and I have talked about how not to fund because I had a lot of creative ideas where you said that would be really idiotic, Keith. Well, thank you for letting me know that in advance. Well, you may not have said it that way, but you told me that. I hope I didn't. Idea. But to you, I might have. You might have. You might have. Because you, you and I, we can talk to each other like that, which is which is awesome. Right. I'm always trying to find creative ways to pass to the next generation. Uh, yeah. And Ryan said, well, this is how it's going to apply if it gets taxed. So why don't you share with us um, the tax implications of special needs trust? Because I know it has the compressed thing um, mm. and how to fund and how what kinds of things not to fund. Can you talk briefly about that? And this is sort of answering all the questions relating to that that came in. OK, and then I'll, I'll right. go over here to some of the questions that came in. Yeah. So so obviously there's a there's all sorts of different ways to fund it, I think. One, I think what it comes down to is is what's the most efficient way to fund it, um, you know, for it, for families. And so, you know, one of the things that I see a lot is obviously uh, so many folks just in our every day, um, you know, work for a company. And when you work for a company, you sign up for the retirement plan. Most of them are called a 401k and you start putting money in there and you like it because you don't pay taxes on the money each and every year that you make a contribution. Um, what we forget about is that that money is growing, yes, tax deferred, but at some point will be taxed. And if all your money sits in that kind of an account, that's probably gonna be the account that's gonna end up funding the special needs trust, um, you know, just for lack of anything else being there, just because you didn't think about it until later. Um, and so what happens with that account is it's never been taxed. And so when you take it out for retirement, whatever you take out gets gets taxed as income. If you die and that's the funding mechanism, which for a lot of people it is um, until they see us the uh, um, and realize, holy mackerel, that's going to cost me a lot of money, is, is that that money, again, when you take it out, it's going to be taxed at your income tax rate. Well, if you leave that to the special needs trust, any money that is coming out of that um, every year and into the trust, let's say, um, so it's so the the what's called a beneficiary IRA is now owned by the trust. Well, tr the the trusts in general have what are called what I call compressed tax brackets, meaning that you just run through them faster until you get to the top. Right. So for an individual and I'm not going to get the number right. So please don't um, always change. Email Keith. <laughs> yeah, please don't Google it and email Keith. Ryan doesn't know what he's talking about. But let, let's say for an individual single person, the top tax rates, 400 something thousand dollars for a married couple. The top tax rate, right? The top tax bracket right now is somewhere you have to earn a little bit over six hundred thousand before you hit that thirty seven point four percent top tax rate. Well, inside of a trust, you run through those brackets and you get to the top tax rate at about $13,000 of income. Oh, yeah. I'm wiping my eye to give you time <laughs> to uh, digest that. $13,000 of income, you hit the 37.4%. And if you live in a state with state income tax, like California, yep, New York. like California, like New York, like, New York, I mean, there's only three of them, I think that don't. So most people are going to live in one that does. Plus that, plus m right now, most of them will also have what's called the 3.8% net investment income tax as well. So you start adding those up and you're like, holy cow, that might be 50%. And we're at the lowest, the third lowest ever income tax rates in the history of income tax rates since like 1903. And where are they headed? $30 trillion of debt, <laughs> low income taxes. They're probably going up, right? At least the top tax rate will. And again, a lot of us individually aren't worried about that. But we are for the special needs trust component. Give an example. So, so if you have, if you have $100,000 worth of income into that and it's compressed, they take the first 13000 off. Right. They'll make that well, it's not off. I mean, it, it runs through the bracket. So zero to two thousand and two uh -huh. to four thousand. And then so it's not it's not zero oh, percent. They're, to they're, they're taxing along the way. Oh, four, four they're taxing. Yeah. 
for my simplistic mind, okay, let's say it's only on the top thing. So this is just not accurate, but just for simplicity. So that means that 100,000 in income, take off the first, let's say 10,000, that's 90,000 at 50% tax rate. So you're forking over 45,000 to the government. Is that what you're telling me? Yep, possibly. Yep. Wow. Yeah. Now, now again, there can be some fancy accounting you might be able to do depending on what else is owned in there. But anyway, so so a 401k can be a good tool, but it might not be the best funding tool. Now, again, when you when that when that 401k goes in as a beneficiary to the special needs trust, there's also rules from the Secure Act at the end of 2019 that came into play that still allows a special needs trust because the beneficiary is an individual with disability to take what's called a required minimum distribution, right? So you don't have to take it all out in a compressed time period, whereas before that you did. So that's a benefit to that, but you still have to take out some money out of it every year. And whatever that money you take out of the beneficiary IRA inside the trust, even if you don't take it out, even if you just put it into a checking account owned by the trust, you still have to pay taxes on it. So it could be, it's a very inefficient tax tool. Um, and so you may want to consider other options, right? So, you know, it, one of the most efficient ways to do it, which people hate it, they don't like it, they hear the term, you want to shut down the computer and turn it off. <laughs> but I'm just here to tell you the truth is life insurance. I, I mean, it. It, it, nobody likes to talk about it. I don't even like to say it because you're going to hang up on us, right? <laughs> but in the but from a tax code perspective, I'm just talking tax code, right? Who cares what it's called? From a tax code perspective, any money from life insurance death benefit flows income tax and capital gains tax free. So if you had a hundred thousand dollar life insurance policy it's going to be a hundred thousand dollars for your child and it's going to fund it within seven days so it's also very liquid so if you have a house that's going to fund it and that house has to sell that's not going to fund it very quickly except in this market <laughs> that probably funded within seven days too no it would take longer to close but but anyway you know you have to look at uh, probably uh, for a lot of families, it, it might be a blend of different things. Um, you know, there can be advantages of different investment accounts, right? Some of those can have some tax advantages when they go from generation to generation. Um, you know, those are being heavily looked at right now mm -hmm. um, from a tax legislation level. But again, nothing has changed yet. But that's uh, one of the one of the things to consider when you're funding the trust is a lot of that decision comes down to tax efficiency on how things generationally transfer in the tax code and how quickly they do so, so that your child doesn't have an interruption in care and support needs that you're paying for up and above government benefits. Because once you're dead, as Keith knows, because he just did this with his brother for his father, mm -hmm. things are frozen. 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 Unless they're titled properly or unless there's a beneficiary attached to it directly. And so if it's frozen, the question is, if you didn't plan ahead and understand those rules, who's going to pay for those support needs in the next month? Just an update. We just had our first hearing on our probate situation. What's that? Nine months, 10 months after my dad died. So we just had our first yep. hearing. So we're probably still another year out from getting any of those funds out. So, well, and, and I'm working with a family right now that I met with them earlier today. It's the same thing. They, they're, they're getting an inheritance, but it's been a year since their family member passed away. And it's, it's not a complicated estate, guys, but that's how slow it works. And so, and so, again, you have to look at what your assets look like and how they work, not only while you're alive, but in that moment 
that you die and this plan needs to be functional. Right. right. And that's just part of what we don't look at very often. And most of us don't know because we haven't died. <laughs> I know that sounds so stupid that I just said that like that, but it's true. It is true. We haven't died. Our spouse hasn't died. Right. We, we haven't been through it. So we don't know. But that doesn't mean it still doesn't exist. So it's your responsibility to know, which is why I love the fact you're here. I hopefully you didn't hang up on us, but <laughs> you know, because you want to learn, which is great. But you also have to take action, which is why how to secure the future is here is to help you on that first step to take action at a very cheap price to learn and to go through some action steps to start to put together your plan. That's why we at a special needs plan are here. If you're at, if you're going for that next level of, hey, I actually need a guide for this. I mean, there's help out there. Mm -hmm. You do not have to be on your own. That's what Keith and I are here for. So, you know, if you're struggling on your own and please don't kick me, it's really your choice. It's your choice that you're struggling on your own because you don't have to. Right. People are here to serve you guys. Okay. All right. I'm a little nervous about this, but give me a chance. I am going to try to get some of those questions that I see over there. So Ryan, Let's do it. Ryan and I didn't have a chance to do our pre tech pre webinar technical check in. So I'm going to try something here. Bear with me. Uh, uh Oh, here we go, everybody. No, I know I'm nervous. You know, how I feel about that. I like to test all that stuff. So here we go. I'm going to try to bring you on. Is that you? I, I stress Keith out everybody. No, that is not you. I got to sign. Hey, right. Alan and Tracy, thank you so much. That's very kind of you. Well, I don't think that's going to work. We're going to have to do that something else. Hold on, everybody. All right, Ryan, we're going to have to, um, I'm going to have to go to the questions there because I, we, we, and we'll talk later. Okay. All right. So I see some questions came in. Carolyn Rogers says, I understand the ABLE account grows tax-free versus a special needs trust is taxable as a trust. Is the ABLE account preferred with assets up to 40, up to 400,000? Well, I would say kind of what we talked about before, Carolyn, is I would say it's, perf it's, it's a great tool to keep at $100,000 or lower um, due to the fact of the Medicaid payback provision inside of an ABLE account in most places from a federal level, hopefully that changes, um, and also from an SSI level, uh, that supplemental security income still being there. Um, so for now, again, barring knowing the rest of your situation, as kind of just a general rule, I try to keep ABLE accounts under a hundred grand. Right, because you do lose some of those benefits, right? Yeah, now again, yeah. So we could go into a whole nother thing if, you know, as parents retire, that decision might change. Right, we have talked about that in previous webinars. We have. And just remember yeah. guys, you can always look at some of our historical webinars on pool, trust, yes. special needs trust, on um, the importance of a ABLE account. account and special needs trust are the same because we get in depth on those. At the request of some parents last time, they had suggested that we break our question and answer webinars to a specific topic. Because we did our last one that was on everything and it was all over the place. Right. And I've, it was. We didn't know how that was going to play out, but we've learned our lesson from that. Um, so Slim Dog, I like that name. Hey, all right. <laughs> Slim Dog, but, would, but, but wouldn't you want to fund the specialist trust at death to avoid the massive tax drag, perhaps from a revocable living trust? Uh, again, it, depending on your individual situation, um, you might not want to put a lot of money in that special needs trust um, early on in your life. Yes, you're right. Because but you and you because you have to manage that trust with taxes in mind, just like we talked about when you fund it, you have to fund it with taxes in mind. But then just like you said, Slim Dog, you got to manage it with taxes in mind. So so for the most part, usually we're looking at parents saying we we want to fund it later in life with the majority of the money. What what we're saying is just to prepare the other people for less things to do is, hey, if you open a special needs trust account with a hundred bucks and just keep it in a money market or a checking account, there's no taxes to pay. 
and it's open. Yeah, is it a lost hundred bucks? Yeah. But man, those next people are going to praise you right. for doing it. Because you're going to have already got the tax ID number and all the things to create it, which if they don't know what they're doing, then they're going to have to learn at the same time they're mourning your loss. So Amen. For, that, Amen. for that reason, I agree. So Mark Ambrose, sorry your name is not the same as Slim Dog, but I'm going to go ahead and broadcast it. And go. Slim Dog is going to be my new <laughs> name. I like that. <laughs> uh, Mark Ambrose is asking, I'm funding the great majority of my daughter's at attainment of room tone. <laughs> I'm funding the great majority of mine, my daughter, at attainment of room. All right. Maybe I didn't mean that. I'm sorry, Mark. Gordon Colson's assets would typically qualify for a special needs trust how much in assets? Well, it, it depends. I mean, you can have as many assets as you want in the special needs trust. If you're looking for a corporate trustee, meaning a company like a bank or a financial institution to manage it or to be the trustee, you're probably looking somewhere of a million dollars to have that in there. Um, but there are other options below that. Uh, but if you're looking for a corporate trustee like a bank, that's probably going to be the number. But that doesn't mean that families have to fund a special needs trust with a million dollars because you could have other folks as a trustee that there wouldn't be that minimum. Right. Um, Michael D. Amico, I think I've met him a few times on, um, on YouTube. He says, I, I don't know the answer to this, so we're going to ask it. Does the S&T get the 250K gain exclusion if the S&T sells a house? If the SNT sells the house, well, no, because it's not a prime. It's like the SNT is not a person that lives in the house as its primary residence, mm -hmm. right? Because somebody else is living there as the primary resident. And usually that person's paying rent, as I mentioned before. So the individual with the disability would normally have a lease agreement with the trust so that it would really be an income generating entity for the trust to help pay for other things, you know, for the individual with a disability possibly. Um, but that's a good question. I'm, I'm going to look into that a little bit more, but on the top, just on the face of it, I've never seen that work. Well, let me ask you a question. Um, the, 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 the concept is, is if you're a husband and wife, um, and, and someone dies and they can take the exclusion uh, because their husband and wife kind of situation. But what if, yep. would it make sense to claim those exclusions before the trust gets it? Can you gift it to the trust and well, it's already after the parents have, have claimed those? Well, right now, um, the there's, there's still a step up in cost basis on the sale of a home to the next generation. And that would include the trust. So if, if somebody bought a house for 250 at this point and it's worth a million dollars, well, when that person dies, that next generation's cost base of that house is a million bucks. So there's no taxes to pay or anything else. And if the special needs trust is the one that's going to receive that, they get that same step up in cost basis as it exists today. Okay. Um, we answered that one. I just want to pull up all Slim Dog stuff. I just do. <laughs> I just like that. Um, for the same reason, student loans, government benefits, can I keep funds in the ABLE account? Uh, do you know what he's asking there, Ryan? I'll broadcast it so you can see. I don't. Um... All right. Well, we'll come back. To yes, that. You, you can keep funds in an ABLE account and still receive government benefits. Okay. That's that's one of the ideas of it. Yes. Okay, cool. Thank you, Ryan. Um, so how about the Roth IRA? Um, would a Roth IRA be a good one to fund a special needs trust since it's already post tax? It's already been taxed. Yep, that's another good one. So life insurance is good for the things that we talked about. But Roth IRA since it's already been taxed. So yeah, absolutely. 401 Kios and Traditional IRAs, probably not so much. Not so just because of the tax implication of it. But you got to be concerned about that because if you're at a compressed rate paying almost 50 percent, that's pretty significant loss of um, principal. It is. It is. But there's always something to do if you do it ahead of time. 
True. True. Uh, let's see. These guys are all talking to themselves. Is I so good? No. Awesome. Uh, Roz eight hundred five. I hope she's from the eight hundred five, like Bakersfield. Be our shout out to the other Californian there. Um, we have three conservative adults. Do we need three separate special needs or trusts, or can we have one? Um, you should really have three different ones um, because it's supposed to be, you know, for the uh, primary benefit of the beneficiary of that trust. Um, so it, we always suggest that you do three just to be make, make sure that it works appropriately. All right. Let's see here. Um, I like the outfit on Roz 8052. That was pretty that was pretty sweet. I, I, I don't know if that's her outfit or just one that she found, but. You know, but her question makes me ask a question, too. So if because um, like for my 529 regular college fund account, I had created one for both of my sons, um, but it became obvious that my second son was not necessarily going to go to college. So I transferred his over to his ABLE account. Um, so but I yeah. could have had just one 529 account. And if my first son didn't use it all, he could have I could have change the beneficiary or whoever it's called there to my second son, right? You can. All right. So there's yes. value there, but it's different here because especially these trust is for that unique individual. Right. Um, yes, Alan and Tracy Reed. Um, yeah, once you get over $100,000, it becomes a challenge potentially for qual qualify for benefits. But all that means is that you need to pay it down and buy some things. You should be monitoring it. But that's something you should communicate with the next caregiver because they may not know. They may think it's a benefit to grow that as much as possible and not recognize the other side that will hit them when they lose that money that they've been getting on a monthly basis. So um, you're aware of it, but make sure you communicate that to the next generation. Is that fair, Ryan? Yes. Let's see. What else are you? Um, Carolyn Rogers says, I thought they don't impact benefits until after 400000 I bet you, Ryan, that she's referring to the limits that a lot of those um, able yeah. to say that, oh, $500,000 limit, whatever it is. But that's unrelated to the law that says anything over 100000 is impacted, right? Yep. So so every state that has an ABLE account will have an annual, uh, will have a total account value maximum that can be in there. And, and all of those maximums are higher than the $100,000 account value maximum where SSI is suspended. So two totally different things. Um, but so Carolyn, you're right. You can put more than $100,000 in, in, in every ABLE account that exists. It's just when you do, you will lose one of those, one of the government benefits and that is called SSI supplemental security income, which is the monthly income. So that's why another reason you'd want to have that money partitioned potentially into a third party trust. That's right. right? So yep. it can grow to whatever amount it can grow to. Um, and it yep. has none of those same limitations. Okay. Right. Um, Angie Schuler, I'm going to pull it. Can I transfer dollars from a trust to an ABLE account? Yes. There we go. Ryan, you are direct and succinct. That is a rare, rare thing. I love it. <laughs> that is rare, my friend. All right. Uh, May Baird asks, can I roll over? Can I roll dollars over? Let me bring it up here. Can I roll dollars over from a first party S&T to an ABLE account, keeping within the annual limit? That's the same question as before, right? Yes. Keeping within the annual limits. First party is that same ability? Yep. So I could contact my son's first party trustee and say, hey, transfer some money i might have to educate them maybe potentially but you can all right i leave those guys alone they they, they do the investments um much love back to you there slim dog um <laughs> these guys are funny um burn can ryan please answer my question above burnshaw can you re-answer i must have missed it if you have a question from above because this is the last question we're going to wrap up soon i want to get to you I didn't see a question from Burn Jog. I'm going to try to look for it real quick. Oh. Oh, okay. Here it is. Do you have any questions on how to word a letter to the judge for a court ordered blocked account? I would like to get the balance transferred to an ABLE account as the balance is only $8,000. Let me bring it up. 
Um, that's a good question. Uh, I would, I'm not sure what the reason for the blocked account might be. It could be that, um, I don't know, it sometimes judges block accounts because it's, uh, because the child's a minor um and because it came from an inheritance from somebody else we we had that happen what does block you know, that, mean i don't even understand the question well it means the court's holding it because let's say a grandparent gave money directly to a grandchild mm -hmm. um, and the grandchild's 13 years old well the court's responsible for that money now guess what it is wrapped up inside the court so there's no way for the parents to get the money um, or really for the child to get it and so usually they do a court appointed guardian of the estate is usually what happens for those. And there goes that 8,000 <laughs> right. in fees, right? Right. And so maybe, maybe that's how, I, maybe that's how you should word it. Say, listen, I don't want all this money to go up in fees. My child has a disability. I don't want it to go directly to them. You know, is it possible to use what's called an able account to put this money in for their future? Yeah. Um, I learned I learned something new there myself. Yeah. All right, Ryan, I'm gonna take a quick quick look at if you had other questions. We tried to answer some of the questions that were related in one general response instead of going to each one individually. But hopefully, those who took the time to enter in some questions heard responses to your questions. We try as best we can. Can't get to everybody because you guys are lots of you guys out there. Uh, yeah, which is great. Thank you for coming. Uh, do, 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 do. What you talked about the benefits or the differences between the irrevocable and a special needs trust, the language of the special needs yep. trust. But I remember my special needs trust that says this is designed to protect my son's assets and to da, 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 make sure he has government benefits, whereas my irrevocable trust has none of that language, right? You got it. It was, yep. more, it was more asset protection. Um, how do I do a special needs trust for my dependent young adult who is dependent dis is dependent disabled child? Is there a guide? She is on my Tricare for survival benefits. Do you understand what that question is asking? I think it's uh, with the military benefits. So, you know, if if you want, it's because Tricare is a military benefit. So if you have a military pension, you can leave your military pension to a very specific type of special needs trust that qualifies to receive that income and not count that income against your child's monthly maximum income limit to qualify for government benefits. That's a very specific, that's another very unique and specific type of special needs trust where you definitely need an attorney who knows what they're doing with that type of trust, if that's the question that you're asking. Well, that brings up something else that I saw that come in a few times. I know some people have went out and got their trust done and they're asking whether or not their trust was designed right. If you're asking that question, most likely there's some challenges because whoever you hire, it should have given you that kind of confidence in their answers and their way they interacted, meaning that we have a series of questions that we ask our, you know, our, our, our customer clients to ask potential attorneys to see if they have any idea. If they don't know what an IEP is, they don't know what SSI income is, they don't know some of these things, then they're not the right one. Because some of these attorneys get these cooker, cookie cutter templates and they just put in your name and charge you $3,000. Um, it can't be that way. When I was working with my attorney to create mine, we had a dialogue about what I was trying to achieve, what I wanted to accomplish, and they made changes to my plan to accommodate some of the things that were important to me and my family. So it's important that if you had it designed by someone, you're uncertain about that, then I don't know for sure, and I'm not an attorney, but I would say that I don't have any about whether mine was designed. So it's not even a question. I know it was. So you should probably dig a little deeper and to see, I mean, I don't know where I, how, how do they address that? Yeah, I, I would just say, you know, it, it, you could have somebody else take a look at it. You could, if you wanted to, one of the things you could do is you call Social Security mm -hmm. um, and have them take a look at it. 
Yeah, and ask find them out to, now. <laughs> well, oh, it's better to find out now and ask them to review your trust to make sure it qualifies. That's a good idea. I hadn't thought about it. See, Ryan, you are awesome. All right, we're yeah. going to wrap up with just thank you. And that's, that's actually a question that you could ask an attorney that you're hiring. Have any of your trusts been reviewed by Social Security and have they been approved as a special needs trust to qualify? Okay. Because if they haven't, then maybe they haven't written enough of them. <laughs> True. Well, you know, again, it, it, special needs trusts get audited. So if there's an attorney that writes a lot of them, they've probably been through that process before. And it, and it, and it, and it made it cut, cut the mustard. You don't want to find out the hard way that, oops, this yeah. guy, he didn't really know what he's doing. Now you're trying to get, you know, re reimbursed through his you know, his E and O insurance or whatever he's got, as opposed to having it done right. And your child's still in this situation. So right. Ryan, I, I think I know the answer to this one, but I'm going to, we're going to wrap up with this one from May Baird. Um, do you have to file a tax return for an able account? I don't think so, but I'll let you go ahead and answer that. Nope. You do not have to. And you don't have to do one for a special needs trust unless it's over a certain dollar amount, right? Right. Yeah. If it earns more than a hundred dollars of income, you should be doing a, a, a trust tax return. So it's not very high. All right. And all right. I, I lied. So we're going to finish with Sharice Ray. <laughs> um, can a third party special needs trust be either revocable or irrevocable? It has to be irrevocable. Yeah, it, it should be irrevocable. We've we've had a few that have been revocable that that seem to pass the test. Um, but we we lean on the side of let's make sure we don't give them any reason not to use it. So we, we like to lean on the side of irrevocable um, as a preference. Okay, everybody, we thank you. Um, thank you. Some of the people said they learned something from us today. So that's pretty awesome. Um, and we, we awesome. learned something today. We learned that Ryan and I need to get together a few minutes before to check our technology. Um, and we will do so, and we will always continue to endeavor to do better. Thank you guys for joining us. Any final words of wisdom, Mr. Platt? Oh, man. I, did, did I have any words of wisdom anyway? Absolutely. Even, even during the hour and 20 minutes, I'm not sure. So for parting words of wisdom, I don't know if I have any of those either. All right, you guys. Thank you very much. We will see you guys at the next one. <laughs>